Once I had a heavy burden, I was sinking down. I was underneath my circumstance, I was losing ground. Then I gave it all to Jesus, and he reached way down. Protected by the one who holds me near. In the palm of his hand is mighty hand. In the palm of his hand. Do you have a heavy burden from the cares of life? Searching for the answers to all your trouble and strife. Just remember he has promised if you trust in him, he will carry you through. He's the one who can in the palm of his hand, in the palm of his Protected by the one who holds me near. In the palm of his hand, his mighty hand. In the palm of his hand. In the palm of his hand. No safer place could I ever be. In the palm of his hand, I'm ever sheltered. Protected by the one who holds me near. In the palm of his hand, his mighty hand, in the palm of his hand. I will not worry, I will not fear. Protected by the one who holds me near. In the palm of his hand, in the palm of his hand, his mighty hand. In the palm of his hand. Amen. All right. Well, that's a good and a safe place to be at, isn't it? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to have one more song and then we're going to pray. And then Brother Frank is going to come. So last night, uh, by the way, welcome to Revival tonight. Last night we had Brother Andrew Phipps from Muncie, Indiana, and uh, wonderful, wonderful service there, amen? And then Brother Noah Broughton last night, and tonight we're looking forward to Brother Frank preaching, and then Brother Lawrence is here, he's going to be preaching, and then uh, tomorrow we'll continue, and we'll see what, what takes place tomorrow evening after the services. But we're very thankful for the opportunity that God has given us here on this Labor Day weekend to be here, and I know it's been a busy weekend, and a lot of people are back to work today, and, uh, but you're here, and that's, that's good, amen. All right, in Christ alone. That's where we need to place our trust. In Christ alone, he'll never fail you. You can trust him, amen? All right, we'll have the ladies sing before Brother Frank comes. In Christ alone will I glory, though I could pride myself in battles won. For I've been blessed beyond measure, and by His strength alone I overcome. Oh, I could stop and count 
successes like diamonds in my hands. But those trophies could not equal to the grace by which I stand. In Christ alone, I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory, let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. By the way, we did hear from Brother Noah this morning, and he wanted me to thank the ladies for the singing last night, Brother Noah Broughton. He called me this morning and wanted me to thank the ladies for the singing and wanted to thank the church. So, Brother Frank, now some of you don't know that Brother Frank is now on the radio with us. We're on about seven, nine, eight different, nine different stations. We're getting ready to pick up two more. But last week, as I was giving the introduction, I said, I'm going to introduce to you, and the program is called A Man on a Mission. Hey. I want to welcome you to this morning's program, A Man on a Mission with Evangelist Franklin Stewart. And I said he's been preaching the gospel for over 60. Now, I knew 70, but it gave him something to talk about. <laughs> so I walked out and he goes, well, the pastor said 60. And I heard him go on about 70. I thought, well, been preaching the word of God for 70 years. And we thank the Lord for that. Amen. Amen. God bless you, brother Frank. Thank you, preacher. You're welcome. Hey. Well, it's good to be in the good Lord's house again. Amen. Amen. And I'm glad that Brother Hart's got enough confidence in me to let me uh, stand be behind his pulpit. Uh, we'll be preaching out of a chapter back in the Old Testament. It's in uh, Psalms 126. I've used this before here, I think, but uh, it's what we need, so... I heard one time that some old preacher was having a revival and he'd preach 
That's when they had them for a week. And he'd preach six nights, and every night it was on re repentance. And so uh, when he got out of the pulpit, some man walked up to him and said, when are you going to quit preaching on repentance? He said, when you all repent. <laughs> so so uh, I'm going to preach on the three thoughts mainly tonight. Uh, one of the thoughts in here that I see is uh, conviction. And then the next one is contrition, and the next one is compassion. And all three of those things is really, really needful in our day. If we had enough conviction as saved people, the church house would be full all the time. But there's a lot of people that's saved that hardly ever goes to church. That's a shame. It is a shame. They don't have no conviction about them, see? Oh, we need conviction. Lord, God help us in that. But once you got that conviction and you are saved, you need contrition so that you can be what you ought to be for Jesus. Because God hates a proud look. But he won't resist the uh, humble. Back the way back in Micah, I was reading one time, and he said, I'm going to show you, old man, what the Lord requires of thee. He said, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Yeah. That's what the Lord wants. Yeah. See, if we do justly, that means you do what's right. If you love mercy, you'll be concerned about them that don't have it, and you'll want to be a soul winner. You'll be godlike. See, he's very merciful. There's a verse way back in Lamentations, chapter 3 and verse 22 said, It is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. And then it says, Great is thy faithfulness. If God wasn't so merciful, none of us would wind up in heaven. We'd all wind up in hell because we're sinners. We got that Adam nature. But because of God's mercy, he puts up with us sometime 80, 90 years. He's put up with me for 91 years now. Unbelievable. Why the Lord didn't cut me off. Cause way back when I was a teenager, I was crazy. I was raised, my daddy was a drunk and my older brother, he was almost as bad as dad. And I kind of thought that was the way to go. So I started drinking and driving like a maniac and no seat belts back in those days. That's one reason why my knees hurts now. But when you're 91 years old, your joints get bad regardless. But I caused a lot of my own problems. I think the only reason I'm living is because God knows as long as I've got breath, I'm going to be praising him. Yeah. Hey. So I'm going to give you a couple of verses. The shortest chapter in the Bible. Does anybody know where that is? Psalm 117. That's Psalms 117. It's only two verses. It says, Oh, praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you people, for his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. If, if you learn that, it'll help you to be a better Christian because it'll help you to want to praise him. And he's worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. Amen. Bible says, you're not your own, you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is the Lord's. I remember old John Rollins, uh, he was a kind of cantankerous and he was in the pulpit one day talking about uh, one of his members and he said, uh, I told him that we're starting revival Sunday. Now we want you to be here. And he said, well, preacher, I, we got a family reunion down in Kentucky. And uh, he said, I have to go down there. But he said, uh, uh, I'll be with you in spirit. John said, you send your spirit down there. We want your body. Do you hear what that verse said? You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. 
In other words, the way you live in your body, what you do, speaks louder than what you say sometimes. A lot of times it does, don't it? So I'm gonna quote you that chapter. Uh, it says, uh, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, where were like them that dream? But then was their mouth filled with laughter and their tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord had done great things for them. He said, the Lord had done great things for us. Whereof we are glad. Then he said, turn us again, O Lord, as the streams in the south, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again, and that with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now that's that one short chapter. And uh, I've asked the Lord to help me memorize scripture. So I know several shorter chapters in this uh, Psalms. But this is a great chapter right here. Now I done told you there are three main thoughts that I see in this. The very first verse said, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. That word turned means that this whole nation here had got enough conviction to turn back to the Lord and he brought them out of captivity. See, the devil, he's like a roaring lion seeking who may devour. And he, he wants to use you. Even if you're saved, you've got the old sin nature. And if you don't fight against Satan, the Bible says resist him steadfast in the faith. That means you need to have enough conviction about you. See, the word conviction, if you look it up, it means convinced. Well, that's the only way you can have real faith. You've got to be convinced. So without conviction, you ain't going to never have enough faith to get saved even. But after you are saved, if you don't fight against self and say no to sin, self, and Satan, yes to the Savior, you can't be in God's will. You, you can't do God's will unless you deny yourself. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. If we follow him, we'll be humble. That means we'll be submissive. If we're submissive, we'll love God. See, the great commandment is, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said, the second is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. And then as you're thinking about love, a little later he, he gave his disciples another new commandment. You love one another as I have loved you. By this, all men know you're my disciples. Now why did he say the greatest is to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Why did you call that the greatest? Because if you love him like he asked you to, you're gonna put him first all the time and you'll love your neighbor, you'll love the family of God like you ought to. Everything else falls right in line if you just take that one, just to take that one, get really serious about that. Everything else falls right in line. So we need enough conviction. And I'm gonna to talk to you about, about three things mainly. We need enough conviction to believe the Word of God is God's Word. Amen. Now, I'll quote you another psalm that deals with this thought. Psalm chapter 1 said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor saith in the seat of scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And it doth he meditate day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringeth forth his fruit in his seeds. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. But the ungodly are not so. They're like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now why, why did I quote that? His delight that blessed man, that happy man, yeah. that'll be the man that loves God's word. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. 
he loves God's word so much he wants to put the Lord first all the time. Now we got the Adam nature and if we don't fight against it, the Bible says that if you go over to the fourth chapter of Ephesians, it said give the devil no place. He said, put on that new man. See, and he, another place says, uh, be clothed with humility. Well, that's the new man. When you put on the new man, you'll deny old self. And I'm telling you people, I've been preaching now about 71 years and uh, I still need to ask the Lord to help me to say no to sin, self, and Satan, and yes to him. I need to pray like that all the time. I'll, get, I'll give you a little illustration. Uh, when I resigned my church, I'd been there 38 years with them, and I felt like that, uh, that uh, I needed to move on and let some younger person take it. And so I resigned pastoral work. I got a call from India. My brother K.M. Rao, a man I'd helped for 30 some years, he called me and said, uh, Brother Stewart, since you're not pastoring, you could come over here and help me some. And he said, would you pray about it? And I said, yeah. But uh, the way I was praying was, uh, Lord, I know you don't want me going to India. See, I wanted my way. I didn't want to go to India. But a little old preacher, uh, Brother Larry, I was over there. See, I, I come over there and joined in with you guys over at uh, Brother Foster's when I resigned. And a little old preacher come by there. He's a missionary. And uh, he didn't do much preaching, but uh, he said this. He said, you know, some of these older preachers he said, uh, they say they're retiring. And he said, you can't even find that word in the Bible. And he said, some of them uh, is just wanting to get in the comfort zone. He said, that's very ungodly because he said, uh, Jesus said, follow me. And Jesus never did look for the comfort zone. Amen. He said, some of these older preachers is really ungodly because they won't mind the Lord. They just want to get in the comfort zone. Well, when the invitation was given, I come to the altar and told the Lord I'd go to India. Hey. See, if we don't say to know to ourselves and deny old self, we won't be Christ-like. Yeah. We might have a form of godliness, but we're denying him. He wants to be first. He wants us to put him first. If we put him first, everything else falls in line. But you ain't going to do it unless you got enough conviction about you to be convinced that he is the Lord God Almighty and he deserves the best. We, we need conviction about us, about God's word. We need to delight ourselves in it and We'll prosper in every way if we put him first. Everything else will fall right in line. And as I was thinking about this, I thought, well, I'll just talk about the Word of God a little bit. Listen to this chapter. In uh, Psalms chapter 12, it says, Help, Lord, for the godly man cease, and the faithful fell from among the children of men. For they all speak vanity, every one with another. With flattering lips and a double tongue do they speak. But God will cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things who say with our tongue we shall prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? He said, for the oppression of the poor and the sighing of the needy, I will arise, saith the Lord, and set him in safety from him that puffeth him. For God's word is pure. God's word is pure as silver tried in a furnace of earth. He said, uh, God's word is so pure that he'll preserve it and from this generation and forever, God's word is pure. And we need enough conviction about us to believe that 
and keep on living in the light of the word. The Bible says in James chapter one, he said, be ye doers of the word, not hearers only. You're deceiving your own selves if you're just hearers only. But we need to be doers of the word. Need enough conviction about us to believe that God's word is every word is pure and that he has preserved it from this generation and forever. I thanks be unto God that we have a book it's a light unto our pathway and a lamp unto our feet. I say, hallelujah, hallelujah. what a Savior. Yes, he's, he's good. And the, another thing, there are three things mainly in this chapter. The very first one was the, these people had repented. They had really turned to the Lord. And boy, they got to victory. They said their mouths would fill with laughter and their tongue was singing. I say, hallelujah. And uh, even the heathen said, the Lord done great things for them. Isn't that something? That's right, right there. There, verse two, the Lord done great things for them. And then he said, the Lord hath done great things for us. Whereof we're glad. You know, I'm glad. And I said, when I got up here, the preacher's got enough confidence to let me uh, stand behind his pulpit and preach. But I'm glad, see the Lord done that. The preacher don't get all the glory because the Lord is leading him to have some confidence in this old preacher. Amen. And I praise God for that. I thank the Lord that, you know, the Bible says, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. He said, you ought to be thankful for all things for this is the will of God yeah. in Christ Jesus concerning you. And uh, boy, if there's anything that's missing in our day, is uh, being ungrateful. Oh, I should thank the Lord more every day than I what I do. Oh, me. Lord, help us all to ask God Almighty to help us to be more thankful for all things, even the things that look like it's bad. God, let it happen for your good. Right, amen. Bible said we know that all things work together for good to them love the Lord. Them are called according to his purpose. I know it. I know that, that's the truth. It don't matter what happens. It'll make you draw closer to the Lord if it's a hard knock. I've been through a few hard knocks, but it's made me a, a stronger Christian, seeing how God can work and help us to come out of it rejoicing and praising Him. Yeah. Yeah, I praise Him. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise Him, all you people. Why? For His merciful kindness, great toward us. Truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise you, the Lord. So we need enough conviction about us to really believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel is defined in 1 Corinthians 15, if you'd look at uh, 15, read one verse uh, one, two, and three. It tells you that the gospel that Paul preached was the same that he had received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and was buried and rose again according to the scripture. See, we need to have enough conviction about us to believe in this so strongly that we will do our best to get behind the great commission the Great Commission is not a great suggestion. The Great Commission is a great command that the Lord gave to the church. He said in Acts 1, 8, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto the uttermost part. Here's where we are. We're in the uttermost part. But I got enough conviction to join a church that believes in this. Our preacher believes that we should do our dead level best to send the gospel around the world. He believes that so strongly that the sun never sets on the ministry of Bible Baptists because when we're sleeping, we got people in India and different places that's preaching the gospel. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, we need to get behind it because that's what all four gospels deals with it. Matthew 28 said that we're going to all the nations 
and teach them and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Then teach them all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And then the next uh, gospel book said in the 16th chapter, verse 15 of Mark, it says you go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. We got to get serious about this thing. I say hallelujah. And then you go to Luke 24 and it says, you go and preach repentance to all nations. See, not only did he tell them to go, he said, you preach repentance to them for the remission of sins. That's what it says. And then I think the greatest thing he said about the Great Commission is found over in John chapter 20, verse 21, where he says, as the Father sent me, even so send I you. How did the Father send him? He sent him in love. He sent him in humility. That's the way we're to go. We're to go in love. See this, this chapter that I, I quoted to you and started on. We dealt with repentance pretty much. But that fourth verse says, Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Well, when I first read that, I, I didn't hardly understand exactly what he's talking about. So I prayed about it, and this is what the Lord told me. He said, the streams in the south does exactly what God wills them to do. He said, the streams in the south don't have no will against God. They go where he wants them to go. They do what he wants them to do. They wind up where he wants them to be. So he's talking about contrition here, submission. The streams in the south does not resist the will of God, but we got an Adam nature. And before we're saved, we resist, we resist God. We reject Jesus Christ even, and go on and on and on in sin. Sometimes the Lord lets his mercy shine upon us for 80, 90 years, and then we die and go to hell. But if we accept him, he said, his mercies endureth forever. He said, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your body as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is a reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed in the renewing of your mind, proving what is the good that you might prove what is the good, acceptable, perfect will of God. See, the only way that we can really, really have revival is when we're willing to be contrite, humble, submissive. I'm gonna give you two verses on revival. I think the greatest verses in the Bible on revival. Second Corinthians seven fourteen said, if my people, which are called by my name, will what? Humble themselves and pray, seek my faith, turn from their wicked way. Then will I hear from heaven. I will answer their prayer. I will forgive their sins. I will heal their land. Yes. But what was, the, what was the first thing? Humble themselves. I don't care how much you pray. If you're not humble, God's gonna resist you, resist the proud. But here's another verse on humility. Listen to this. It's out of Isaiah 57, 15. He said, for thus saith a lofty one, a holy one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. Yes. He said, I dwell in a high and holy place with him also that is a contrite heart and a humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble, revive the heart of the contrite ones. Boy, that's a great verse on revival. Not only will he revive you, but if you've got that humble and contrite heart, if you're really contrite, if you're really submissive, God will keep you in that high and holy place. And God can really mold and make and use you to the praise of the glory. But I'm telling you, without humility, we can't please the Lord because he said he gave us more grace to the humble, but he resists us the proud. That's it found over in James chapter four, verse six. And so I'm praying that you'll see that we need great conviction. 
which will bring us great contrition. And then the last thing in this chapter is the last couple of verses. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. That's compassion. That's love. It is of the Lord's mercies that we're not concerned. Consumed. Why? Because his compassions fail not. Amen. Great is his faithfulness. Oh, I don't know how the Lord put up with me like he has. All I can say is, he is mighty long suffering. But it's because of his mercies that we should give ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. He said, don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed in a renewing of your mind that you might prove what is a good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Compassion. So I'm going to wind the message up with these last few thoughts on compassion. You know, uh, the Lord is so compassionate and we're to follow him. It says in uh, Matthew chapter 9, uh, verse 36, it says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion because they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And then he said to the disciples, pray, he that the Lord of the harvest send forth labors into his vineyard. Have you ever prayed that the Lord would help us to get behind more missionaries and get the word out to those who are lost and undone in Africa, different places, some places where the gospel's never even been heard yet. Some people come through here a while back and I forget their name right now, but they're going to China to preach the gospel. They'll have to work underground because they'll kill them over there if they catch them preaching. But they love the Lord enough, they're going. Lord, God help. And so I'm praying that you'll see that we need to have more compassion. Now, when you think about compassion, it's, it's love in action, actually. Jesus was moved with compassion on the multitude. That's why he died for us, he, because he loved us. John 3, 16 bears that out. God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Next verse says God didn't send us into the world to condemn us but to save us. The next verse said he that believeth is not condemned but he that believeth not is condemned already. Now listen to me. The devil wants to tell you that you're a believer just because you believe in your mind about Jesus. That's not a believer. A true believer is a receiver. He came to his own, they received him not, talking about the Jewish nation, but to as many as received him. To them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Why? Because they were born of God, not of the will of man, flesh or blood, but they were born of God because they opened up to Jesus. He said, I'm knocking at the door. If you hear my voice open, I will come in and sup with you and you with me. And so we need to have that compassion about us. And as I think about that, I think of three thoughts, and I believe I already mentioned it. The first and great co the thing about compassion is where the man asked Jesus in the, it's Matthew 20, 22, 37, he said, which is the great commandment? And Jesus said, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Then he said, the second, and like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. Then later he said, I'm giving you a new one. You love one another as I have loved you, but this all man will know you're my disciples. Now think about these three thoughts. The reason he calls that the great commandment, the first one, is because if you love him, like he said, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you're gonna put him first then you'll love your neighbor like you ought to. You'll be concerned about lost souls around the world. 
and you'll love the church. I'm telling you, my conviction won't let me stay at home when there's a service going on here unless I can't get here. My conviction won't let me sit, sit it and watch television or something else because God is more important than anything in this world. We need enough conviction about us to love God like he asked us to, and when we do, we'll love our neighbor, and we'll love our brethren in the Lord, we'll love the family of God so much that we just, we just can't do anything that would hurt them. But we'll do everything we know to help them. And so that's real compassion, and we'll be more Christ-like. And so that's my message tonight. Enough conviction about us to take God's word so serious that we'll be doers of the word, not hearers only, and that we'll walk contrite before the Lord and we'll love God like we ought to. We'll love lost souls like we ought to. We'll love the brethren like we ought to. And so I'm praying that you'll agree with me that we all need to pray for great conviction. How many of us say, preacher, I'm, I'm hoping and praying that I'll have enough conviction to be what I could be and ought to be for Jesus. Yes. Let me see your hands. Hey. Well, that's the most of you. Hallelujah. God bless you. I'm going to turn service over to the pastor. And I didn't know for sure how long I preached, but I guess I preached too long. But uh, I just mind the Lord, preacher. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Frank. God bless you. Let me help, help him down here. I'll be all right. Well, see, uh, you all thought, well, the pastor will put Frank being 90. I'll put him up front and he'll just kind of say a few things and move out for Brother Lawrence. It didn't work that way. And uh, we appreciate the message. 91 years old, but Brother Frank is very sharp in his mind. And you know what that's a result of? That's a result of sanctification. That's why he's speaking tonight. So, Brother Lawrence, he's, he's plowed a little bit of a path for you. He's playing a little bit of path. Okay, so let's take five minutes. And there's a restroom over here, water fountain. Let's just take five minutes, get up and stretch. Brother Lawrence is going to come. Ladies are going to sing two songs. And we're going to continue on. Thank you, brother.